We use our Wi-Fi every day for work and we use the internet for entertainment and communication. The dependency on technology is at an all-time high thanks to the radical developments and innovation in these last two decades. A big portion of this belongs to ensuring secure channels of communication and data transmission. We have already covered videos on cryptography, encryption and other algorithms such as the DSA, RSA, AES, etc. Today we will be covering the most advanced hash functions known today, the Secure Hash Algorithms family or SHA. Let's take a look at the topics to be covered in today's video. We take a look at what is hashing and its principles, examples and applications. We learn about the origin of the SHA algorithm along with its methodology. There are some distinct characteristics of the SHA family that we cover as well. We take a look at the steps needed to create hashed values using the SHA algorithm and then finally learn about the prospective advantages for the same. Let's first get acquainted with the concept of hashing and its applications. Hashing is the process of scrambling a piece of information or data beyond recognition. We can achieve this using hash functions which are essentially algorithms that perform mathematical operations on the main plain text. The value generated after passing the plain text information through the hash function is called as the hash value, digest or in general just hash of the original data. While this may sound similar to encryption, the major difference is that hashes are made to be irreversible. No decryption key can convert a digest back to its original plain text value. However, a few hashing algorithms have been broken down due to the increase in computational complexity of the new generation computers and processors. There are new algorithms that still stand the test of time and are being used among multiple areas for password storage, integrity verification, etc. Like we discussed earlier, websites use hashing to store user passwords. So how do they make use of these hashed passwords? When a user signs up to a new account, the password is then run through the hash function and the resulting digest is stored on the servers. So the next time a user logs into the account, the same password he enters is passed through the hash function again. If the digest matches with the one stored on the server, then he is allowed to log in to the account. This way, no plain text password gets stored, preventing both the owner from snooping on user data and protecting the user privacy in the unfortunate event of a data breach or a hack. We also use hashing when it comes to verifying data integrity. When a user uploads a file onto the internet, he or she can pass the file through a hash function and upload its digest as well. When a new user downloads the file for personal use, they can again pass the file through the same hash function. The digest values are then compared within the newly generated value and the value uploaded by the user. If the values match, then the data integrity is verified and the value was not corrupted in transit. To generate these hash digests from a standard input, we use hash functions. Such an example of a hash function is the SHA algorithm. Let us learn more about it in our main focus for the day. The secure hash algorithm are a family of cryptographic hash functions that are published by the National Institute of Standards and Technology along with the NSA. It was passed as a Federal Information Processing Standard also known as FIPS. It has four different families of hash functions. SSJ0 is a 160-bit hash function published in 1993 and it was closed down later after an undisclosed significant flaw. SSJ1 is also a 160-bit hash function which resembles the earlier MD5 algorithm. This was designed by the NSA to be a part of the digital signature algorithm. SSJ2 is a family of two similar hash functions with different block sizes known as the SHA-256 and the SHA-512. They differ in the word size. SHA-256 uses 32-bit words, while SHA-512 uses 64-bit words. SHA-3 is a hash function properly known as KCAC. It was chosen in 2012 after a public competition among non-NSA designers. It supports the same hash lengths as SHA-2 and its internal structure differs significantly from the rest of the SHA family. As we have already iterated, the process is straightforward. We pass our plain text message to the SHA hash function. 
which in turn performs certain mathematical operations on the clear text to scramble the data. The 160-bit digest received from this is going to be radically different from the plain text. The goal of any hash function is to produce digests that appear to be random. To be considered cryptographically secure, the hash function should meet two requirements. First, that it is impossible for an attacker to generate a message that matches a specific hash value. And second, it should be impossible for an attacker to create two messages producing the exactly same hash value. Even a slight change in the plain text should trigger a drastic difference in the two digests. This goes a long way in preventing hash collisions, which takes place when two different plain texts have the same digest. The SHA family functions have some characteristics that they need to follow while generating the digests. Let's go through a few of them. The length of the clear text should be less than 2 to the power 64 bits in the case of SHA1 and SHA256. This is essential to keep the plain text compatible with the hash function and the size needs to be in comparison area to keep the digest as random as possible. The length of the hash digest should be 256 bits in the SHA256 algorithm, 512 bits in the SHA512 algorithm and so on. Bigger digest usually suggests significantly more calculations at the cost of speed and space. We typically go for the longest digest to bolster security, but there must be a definite balance between the speed and security of a hash function. By design, all hash functions of the SHA 512, SHA 256 are irreversible. You should neither get a plain text when you have the digest beforehand, nor should the digest provide the original value when you pass it through the same hash function again. Another case of protection is that when the hash digest is passed into the SHA function for a second time, we should get a completely different digest from the first instance. This is done to reduce the chance of brute force attacks. To achieve this level of intricacy, there are a number of steps to be followed before we receive the digest. Let us take a look at the detailed procedure as to how the SHA algorithm works. The first step is to make the plain text compatible with the hash function. To do this, we need to pad the bits in the message. When you receive the input string, you have to make sure the size is 64 bits short of a multiple of 512. When it comes to padding the bits, you must add one first followed by the remaining zeros to round out the extra characters. This prepares our string to have a length just 64 bits less than any multiple of 512. Here on out, we can proceed to the next step where we have to pad the length bits. Initially in the first step, we appended the message in such a way that the total number of bits in the message was 64 bits short from becoming a multiple of 512. Now we add the length of bits in such a way that the total number of bits in the message is a perfect multiple of 512. That means 64 bits plus the length of the original message becomes a multiple of 512. This becomes a final string that needs to be hashed. In the next step, we have to initialize these chaining variables. The entire plain text message can now be broken down into blocks of 512 bits each. Unlike other hash algorithms like MD5, which use four registers or buffers, SHA family use five buffers of 32 bits each. They are named A, B, C, D, and E. These registers go through multiple rounds of operation, where the first iteration has fixed hexadecimal values as can be seen in the screen. Moving on, we have to process each of the 512-bit blocks by breaking each of them into 16 sub-blocks of 32 bits each. Each of them goes through four rounds of operation that use the entire register and have the 512-bit block along with the constant array. Out of those four rounds, each round has 20 iterations. So in general, we have 80 rounds sum total. The constant value of k is an array of 80 elements. Of those 80, 16 elements are being used each round, so that comes out to 80 rounds for each of those elements. The value of t differs by the number of rounds, as can be seen in the table below. A single formula is necessary to calculate the output of each round and iteration. The formula can be ABCDE register is equal to E 
plus a non-linear process P along with a circular shift of A plus WT plus KT. In this formula, ABCD is the register value of the chaining variables as we discussed before. P is the logical process which has a different formula for each round. S5 is a circular shift by 5 bits and WT is a 32-bit string derived from the existing subblock. This can be calculated depending on the iteration at hand. KT signifies a single element of the 80 character element array which changes depending on the particular round at hand. For the values of WT, the first 16 values are the same as that of the subblocks, so there is no extra calculation needed. For the next 64 elements, the value of WT can be calculated as shown in the formula here. To better understand this, let's take a look at how each of this goes in a sequential process. We have our initial register using the 5 words of 32 bits each. In the first step, we put the values of A, B, C and D to the subsequent register as the output. Next, we use a non-linear process P that changes depending on the round and uses the values of B, C and D as input. Whatever output is generated from the non-linear process, it is added with the value of the E register. Next, the value of A is circular shifted by 5 bits and is added with the output generated in the previous step. The next step is adding the value of WT and the constant element of KT. The current output is then stored in the register A. Similarly, this iteration is repeated every round and for each subblock in the process. Once all the registers are complete and all the subblocks are joined together to form the single ciphertext message, we will have our hashed output. Regarding the non-linear process P that uses the values of B, C and D as input, the formula changes every round to maintain a complexity of the program that can withstand brute force attacks. Depending on the round, the values are passed through a logical operation which is then added with the values of WT, KT and so on. Now that we understand how to get our hash digest from the plain text, let us learn about the advantages we obtain when using the SHA hash algorithm instead of relying on data in a plain text format. Digital signatures follow asymmetric encryption methodology to verify the authenticity of a document or a file. Hash algorithms like SHA-256 and the industry standard SHA-512 go a long way in ensuring the verification of signatures. Passwords need not be stored in a plain text format which makes them accessible to hackers and other malicious actors. When using Digest, the database security also gets a boost since the size of all hash values will be the same. In the event of a hack or a breach, the malicious actor will only receive the hash values with no way to regenerate the plain text. In this case, the plain text would be user credentials. Since the hash functions are irreversible by design, it has become a compulsion when storing passwords on the servers. The SSL handshake is a crucial segment of the web browsing sessions and it's done using SHA functions. It consists of your web browsers and the web servers agreeing on encryption keys and hashing authentication to prepare a secure connection. It relies on a combination of symmetric and asymmetric algorithms which ensure the confidentiality of the data transmitted between a web server and a web client like the browsers. You can monitor file corruption by comparing hash values before and after transit. Once the hashes match, file integrity checks are valid and data corruption is avoided. Hash functions will always give the same output for the same input, irrespective of the iteration parameters. It also helps in ensuring that the data hasn't been tampered with en route to the receiver of the message. Hope you learned something interesting today. If you have any queries regarding the topic, feel free to ask us in the comment section and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Subscribe to our channel for more amazing content like this and thank you for watching. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.